Hello, everybody. I am doing this recording instead of being in class today, because as I've said in my messages, I have been, well, I've had uh, COVID now, and I tested positive most recently, and it just wasn't in the best interest to attend campus, obviously. Uh, plus, there's my son has had the flu quite uh, severely, and I might have had a touch of that as well. So it's been a very hard uh, week, and I haven't not been on uh, email or other kind of, uh, well, I just haven't been very involved. And so for that, I, I do apologize, but I was at the same time not feeling well and uh, kind of forced rest, so to speak. So I'm doing this video, and I'm going to cover last week and this week for, for the lecture material. But at the same time, when I'm uh, in class next week, as I will be, uh, I'll, I can certainly answer some questions. And uh, like I say, so I apologize at the same time. It's one of those things. And uh, it's the first time that I had had COVID. And uh, even though I'm vaccinated and everything, and it's not pleasant, uh, I did not have a positive experience. Uh, like I said, I'm still testing positive, but uh, feeling, well, better, better enough to, to be here. So with that out of the way, I'm going to go ahead and get started. The first thing we're going to be talking about is interesting research on mind reading. So with respect to mind reading comes into play uh, the concepts of illusion and uh, versus reality, meaning perceiving things as they are and are, we have to use a certain benchmark, right, for what we call reality, but we'll get to that. And illusion, meaning kind of perceiving things maybe in a way that we think they are or would like them to be. Now, if you recall, last time we were together, we were talking that love is argued to kind of evolve as a commitment device, motivating investment in each other for a long time, powered by strong biological based attachment emotions. The idea here is that if you follow that logic, uh, love should predispose people to view their partners and relationships through rose tinted glasses, meaning to stay committed. So they should see things with maybe as they are, but better than they are uh, in a way to make you feel good about what you have so you stay committed to that relationship. So you derogate others and you, uh, you know, uh, view what you have in a positive manner. Now, research suggests that in general, people tend to be positively biased about their partners and relationships. Okay. But evolutionary theory also argues that judgments of potential mates should be accurate. So otherwise, we might compromise our chance for survival, meaning we, we are making a choice with another person. So you think you want to make an accurate kind of uh, estimation of what that other person is like, uh, both now and also in the context of a relationship. So we have a bit of a kind of a push and a pull here where on the one hand, we, we can logically argue that, well, we should probably be positively biased with respect to perceiving our partner in relationship as a way to stay committed. But at the same time, if we're not paying attention to say reality or what's really going on, then that might not be in our best interest as well. Particularly if say, you know, uh, well, say our, our, our partner is not as committed to the relationship, but we think they are, well, that might undermine the success of the relationship and also maybe them not being as uh, faithful in the relationship as you may be. So uh, that's the question that's been asked by researchers is how can judgments be both biased and accurate? And we'll kind of get into that a little bit here. So now can bias itself be rational? And uh, there's, you know, qualified yes. We think about it like in the terms of say projection. Projection is the process of making attributions, right, explanations for others based on perceptions of the self, also called assumed similarity. So I perceive somebody else in a way that I assume them to be similar to me. So similarity judgments between partners can be quite rational and accurate, especially for attributions regarding closeness, sex, etc. I'll talk more about what that kind of looks like. But can judgments be biased and accurate at the same time? And this is where it's going to get a little like, well, if it's one, it can't be the other, right? Well, technically, it actually can be both or, or neither. And with that, we have to tease that apart a little bit. 
So in the research that's been done, there's, they focused on two types of accuracy that can explain when and how judgments reflect reality. One is, I know the, it's, it's kind of you know, accuracy, but it's called directional bias, but refers systematically to reading a target as either more positive or more negative than some benchmark. So let's say um, your partner, you ask them, you know, so a researcher asks them to rate themselves across a number of traits uh, on a scale of one to seven, and they take an average, and the average is, say, five. Now, you're asked to rate your partner uh, on those same traits, and, you know, the researcher takes your average of your ratings of your partner, and your average is six. So now there's a difference. Your partner says, well, across these traits, I see myself as a five out of a seven, but you see them as a six out of a seven. So it's close, right? It's not that much further away from five. At the same time, it's not exact. So in that case, it's not perfect accuracy. Instead, that's called directional bias, meaning it's more positive than how your partner perceives themselves. And in fact, most people tend to do that in, in relationships, view each other more positively than that person perceives themselves. Now that's focusing on what's called a mean difference. You take an average of a collection of ratings and compare those two averages and see if they are the same or different. The next one is a little bit, excuse me, different. It's called tracking accuracy. This refers to how closely judgments of a target track one or more benchmarks in a relative fashion, a correlation. So let's take those same ratings. Your partner rates themselves on a number of traits. In this case, let's say 10 different things. And across those traits, they rate themselves like four, six, five, seven, three, blah, blah, blah. And now you rate them on those same traits. And now you rate them as say, uh, four, seven, six, five, four. So in that case, if, if, uh, if I did it correctly, the mean of those two sets of ratings is uh, not exact. The self, one person rates themselves and their average is one point lower than how the partner rated them. But if you're to take those numbers and calculate a correlation between them, so don't average them, but now look at how they correlate across the, the set of, of ratings. I rate myself a three, my partner rates me a four. I rate me a four, my partner rates me a five. I rate myself a five, my partner rates me a six. The correlation between those sets of ratings is actually perfect, right? One, 1.0. 1 now, that won't always happen in reality, but that's for this example. So now there's a mean difference, but at the same time, there's a high degree of tracking accuracy. So even though my ratings of my partner are not exact in the mean difference, they are tracking them correlationally across those sets of ratings. Uh, it's not as if they say they're a seven and I say they're a one, and they say they're a one and I say they're a seven. That'd be a negative correlation. Instead, it's a positive correlation. Now, these two types of measures, mean differences as well as correlations, mean differences being directional bias, correlations being tracking accuracy, are, are, are known or uh, has been shown to be independent constructs. What does that mean? Well, Fletcher and Kerr collected results from a number of studies and conducted a meta-analysis. So you take the results from a number of studies and then you compare them to each other in a, uh, in a, in, in a way that where you, you take the results and you force them so that you can standardize them and make them comparable. And long story short, tracking accuracy and directional bias uh, where the research has been able to estimate both uh, are not correlated with each other themselves. So I can have a positive mean bias, but not track my partner very accurately, or I can track my partner very accurately, but not have a positive mean bias, or have both or have neither. They're not associated with each other. Okay, what can this look like? This is just a hypothetical example here. And what we have here is uh, four uh, example correlations. So we have warm and cold from one to seven. That's just, you know, this is to make this simple. This is just uh, four different people, Mary, Joan, Iris, and Anne. And then the ratings are from their partners. And so Mary rates herself on the first panel, a five out of seven on warmth. Joan rates herself a four to seven, Iris rates herself a four to seven, whereas Anne rates herself a three out of a seven. And you'll see that their partners, when they rate them on warmth, also rate them exactly as they rate themselves, five, four, four, three. So in that particular panel, you have what's called high tracking accuracy 
but no directional bias. So there's no mean difference between the ratings overall, right? Uh, and at the same time, uh, the correlation between those sets of ratings would be perfect. Now, in the panel right next to it, you see that uh, you know Iris or Mary Joan Iris and Anne rate themselves exactly the same, but their partners rate them differently. Now we have seven, six, six, five. So now we have again perfect tracking accuracy as in the prior panel, but a mean bias. Now we have a positive mean bias. So you see that there's a difference of two between the ratings of warmth um, of, of those targets uh, from the partners compared to how they rate themselves. Now the two bottom panels, the bottom left, you'll see there that there's uh, there is also high positive directional bias, uh, like the ratings are consistently higher than the partners rate them, than the individuals rate themselves, but there's no tracking accuracy, meaning that correlation is not positive. They're, they're, they're not consistent. And then the bottom right panel, that's the best that, you know, example we could come up with here. So to show that there's no directional bias, the mean across all those ratings is exactly the same and there's no tracking accuracy. They don't track very well as well. So the point is, if we focus on the top two panels specifically here, uh, you can have a case where uh, the tracking accuracy is perfect, but there's no mean bias. And you can have it where the tracking accuracy is perfect and there is a positive mean bias. And those two things can be independent. So in a relationship, I can have a partner that perceives me more positively than I perceive myself. I can also have a partner that perceives, uh, perceives me in a way that's consistent with how I perceive myself across a number of traits. Both of those things can exist. Only one of them may exist or neither of them may exist. Now the question is, uh, in a relationship, what do people tend to say like? What do they respond positively to? Do we want a partner that sees us more positively than we perceive ourselves? Or do we want a partner that perceives us in a way that is similar to how we perceive ourselves? Or maybe do we like both? Because as we can see, they can be independent from one another. Now, before we kind of get to that, I just want to talk about some other research that is very similar uh, uh, to this to show you how, how this can work. It's called affective forecasting error. So let's ask uh, you a question. <laughs> and you think to yourself, okay, um, let's say you didn't get into the school that you really wanted to get into uh, for, for university. You got rejected and, you're, and you, you weren't, that didn't happen yet. You're asked, to, you're asked, how would you feel if that were to happen? And you're to say, oh, that'd be devastating, right? Uh, let's say you know, that was your response. Now, let's say we follow you up and it turns out you didn't get into that school and we asked you how you felt. Well, you wouldn't feel good, but you typically tend to not feel as bad as you thought you would, right? Uh, so instead of being completely devastated, you're just really upset. I know that uh, maybe isn't the best example, uh, but the point is when you think about how something is gonna feel, it often doesn't feel as extremely positive or negative as you think. Like if you're like, oh, I'm gonna go on a vacation somewhere uh, to Hawaii, and you're oh, that's gonna be the best experience of my life. Then you go to Hawaii and you come back, and like, oh, how was that? Oh, that was really great. But when you're thinking about what's going to happen, you're just thinking about the experience. But then when you have to do the experience, a lot of other things come into play. Uh, and then also that can just, uh, you know, um, thinking about something and doing something can be very different experiences. And therefore, after the experience, you don't have often has an, have an, as an intense emotion as you thought you're going to have. So... People, so affective forecasting error is a research application of directional bias and tracking accuracy. As I say here, people tend to believe they'll feel greater distress about relationship events, in this case a breakup, than they actually do. So Eastwick and colleagues ask people, hey, if in your current relationship, if you were to break up, how would you feel? Most people say, oh, I would not, I would not like that at all. It'd be horrible. Then they follow up with these individuals and some of them do break up. And when they do break up, they ask them at that moment okay well how does how do you feel and i'll show you what the results look like in a moment directional bias tends to be off but tracking accuracy is fairly strong and it can depend on context i'll show you the graphs the figures here so that makes sense so the first one on the left uh this is just straight up actual predicted so you ask people how would you feel if your relationship were to end and it says weeks since breakup zero two four six eight ten well they 
would ask people in that moment, they're still in a relationship. How would you feel when it happened? How do you think you'd feel a couple of weeks later? What about four weeks later? So they asked them to imagine. And most people imagine it being not as pleasant uh, right when it happens, but it becoming, you know, you get used to it as time goes on. And, you know, as they say, time heals all. And then when, it, when they do break up, they follow them over that same period of time and ask them, how do you actually feel right now? And in the left panel, you see predicted and actual, predicted is in red. And uh, you see it's, uh, you know, uh, distress is rated at four when it happens, um, right? In terms of predicted, I think I'll be distressed four out of seven, but they're really distressed at just over three out of seven. Uh, and then as time goes on, their predicted distress decreases. And when they actually broke up, their actual distress decreased. So in this case, there's a directional bias in that they thought it was going to be worse than it really was, but it tracked really well. They were still pretty accurate in predicting that they'd be more distressed when it happened and they would gradually uh, get less distressing as time went on. So that's an actual application of directional bias and tracking accuracy. In the right panel, they've just broke this down a little bit. And uh, so this is uh, just taking the same results from the left panel, but breaking it down between people that reported earlier, like when they were in the relationship, not broken up yet, uh, people that were in love when they, they were saying, I'm in love with my partner. And then others that were like, I'm in a relationship, but I'm not in love. And if you remember the research that we talked about in class about the difference of preposition makes about love and in love. So people that you can imagine people that were in love, probably just feeling a little more intense feelings of passion for their partner. So when people said that they were in love and you have the blue and the red lines there, the predicted and the actual, you find the same pattern, but now you find that those folks predicted that they'd be more distressed and they actually were more distressed, but the same pattern holds that they weren't as distressed as they thought they'd be, but it tracked very well. People that reported that they were not in love, uh, predicted that they'd be somewhat distressed, but it gradually dissipate over time. And in fact, when they broke up, they reported uh, not a lot of directional bias and their actual levels of distress were pretty consistent with what they thought it would be. So you can see here when people reported being in love, the breakup was actually more distressing for them. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, they thought it would be more distressing than it really was. So there's a great uh, real life example of tracking accuracy and directional bias. <clears throat> now, the question is, are people aware of the bias and accuracy in their, in their relationship judgments? If I was to ask you about, tell me how you perceive your partner. And then I was to ask you afterwards, do you think you're pretty accurate in how you perceive your partner? Or do you think you're somewhat biased in your judgments? Do you think you're kind of fudging the numbers a little bit? And indeed, there is some evidence that for directional bias, some people are aware of that, meaning they're like, you know, I might be, I might have some rose colored glasses as we call them. I might be perceiving my partner more positively than they actually are, but I don't know. I just, that's just how I see them. And I just feel that way. So they're somewhat aware of that, but not for tracking accuracy. People aren't as good at say, oh, I'm pretty good at tracking how, uh, my partner across all their different traits. That, you know, a mean difference, like, you know, six minus five is plus one, kind of is a little easier to contemplate than six, five, four, three, two, one, and try to track that across a number of traits. Maybe that's kind of one of the reasons. Also, people get may get more feedback on directional bias than tracking accuracy. So uh, we, we tend to focus on traits or characteristics one at a time versus a collection of them uh, all at once. Now, what are some causes and consequences of bias and accuracy? Now, in general, uh, greater positive directional bias is associated with higher relationship quality. I perceive my partner more positively than my partner perceives themselves. They, both of us are happier in the relationship. I'm happier because, hey, look, they're great. But they're also happier in the relationship as well compared to if I don't perceive them in a positive directional bias compared to how they perceive themselves. Now, this positive directional bias is associated with a number of things, including we tend to exaggerate attractiveness and trustworthiness. We are more likely to 
forgive and be forgiven. Uh, we tend to you know, mind read intentions. That's like, you know, make up attributions for why they did things that are more positive. When we are asked to recall relationship events, we tend to recall them more positive than they actually were. Uh, we tend to think the relationship will last a lot longer than it may actually will. Uh, and uh, greater satisfaction and increases in self-esteem over time. So when we tend to perceive our partners more positively than they perceive themselves and vice versa, uh, it tends to have a, a positive feedback loop, whereas they feel better about themselves over time, which makes them feel better, which they feel better, you feel better. So there's been a lot of research that tends to show that positive mean difference, like directional bias is generally good for the relationship, makes people feel better. <clears throat> and if you were to ask people, hey, how do you want to be perceived by your partner? Most people will say, yeah, I think it'd be kind of nice if they saw me more positively than I saw myself. That's research by Boys and Fletcher uh, and Bill Swan et al. Uh, in some cases, it can foster false security. So the extent to which people feel optimistic about the future of the relationship, that their partner loves them in spite of their flaws, et cetera. It's like, wow, I can, I can have bad moments or maybe not be the best or maybe not return a phone call or so on. And they still love me and think I'm great. So in that case, you feel it, it feels good. Right. Uh, so uh, versus uh, them perceiving you dead accurately on all of your traits, even the negative ones. That said, there's some research though that suggests that people also want their partners to see them in an authentic fashion. That means how I see myself. Now, I won't go into all the research here, but I'm listing one study. And if you recall those graphs that are, or figures I showed you where you can have positive tracking accuracy as well as a positive mean bias, well, that's when folks, that's what folks tend to like the best. Meaning I don't want my partner's perception of me to be completely different from how I perceive myself, but I want it to be a little bit different than how I perceive myself in a positive way. So if I see myself as a five out of seven on something, if they see me as a 5.5 out of seven, that's good. If I see myself as a three out of seven on something and they see me as a four out of seven on something, well, that's good. Now, if I saw myself as say a two out of seven on a trait, like I'm not that good at this, but my partner's like, oh, you're awesome at that. That might be like, really? Yeah, that's nice, but it's also just not true. So there's a certain kind of amount of positive bias, right? Uh, that uh, is uh, good. And as long as it kind of tracks how I perceive myself across my traits, then that is the most, uh, you know, the, the best condition to be in. Positive directional bias is not always linked to the best relationship outcomes. There are certain contexts where accuracy in that moment is valued more uh, by, by both partners and has better relationship outcomes. So in general, positive relationship bias, good. In certain moments, we need to do away to some degree with our positive relationship bias and focus on accuracy, even if accuracy means that we're perceiving things uh, in, in a way that is you know, not always through rose-colored glasses. What does that mean? Research by Jim McNulty, among others, but I'm gonna highlight just some of his research. When a relationship, when relationships have more severe problems or when partners enact more negative behaviors, uh, positive directional bias promotes satisfaction in the short term, but undermines satisfaction in the long term. So let's say there's a real, like a serious problem in a relationship and uh, I'll make something up here, but let's say, you know, your partner uh, is, uh, have, has like a gambling problem and it's causing some problems in, in your relationship. They're, you know, they're focused on that all the time. It's, it's taking up a lot of money and resources that uh, otherwise would have, you know, been used for the relationship or, or other things or savings. Um, and uh, maybe they're starting to kind of lie about where they are and what they're doing. So that's a problem. Now, just kind of bl being blithely and aware of what's going on and uh, might help in the short term by not causing a problem by bringing it up. But in the long term, that problem's not going to go away and therefore it can be bad down the road. So even though bringing it up now can be distressing right now, you can help solve the problem for later and that can be good. 
So first off, before I get to kind of some of the results of the McNulty research, I just want to show you that in general, positive directional bias tends to decrease slightly over time. So in terms of the length of a relationship, as people are in relationships longer, uh, we tend to, our positive bias tends to get smaller. It doesn't disappear completely, but it gets smaller. And that can be for a number of reasons. You're not trying to impress each other as much as, as, as time goes on. Plus, you have a lot more experiences with each other across a variety of contexts, and you get to know each other very well. And in that case, you're, you just have a lot more information with which to make your relationship evaluations. And therefore, you can be more accurate, whereas before it might be challenging to be more accurate, so you default to being positively biased. As I said already, even though directional bias has an association with relationship quality, in general, tracking accuracy itself is not reliably linked to relationship outcomes. It tends to be like, like I say, in, in those, those moments. Uh, and uh, But it depends on moderators, such as in first meetings, evaluation and prediction goals are most important. So you're getting to, to know somebody for the first time, or maybe you're having your first few dates. Uh, and what you're trying to do is like, a, you know, you're not say lying to each other per se, but you're not going into all the details about what you might think are your negative traits. You're trying to share the positives and see the positives. So now, right, uh, you know, attention to things that are easily observable are assessed with simple questions and certain personality traits and physical aspects are judged with fairly strong accuracy, right? So in some cases, you can be more accurate for some things than others. Like if someone's very outgoing and extroverted, you can be pretty accurate on that. Uh, and if someone's, you know, very physically appealing or not, you can be fairly accurate with, you know, with, with that evaluation. Uh, but other things are a little more challenging. Are they kind, trustworthy, nice, uh, you know, all of those sorts of things. So we're just able to be more accurate with some traits compared to others. Plus we tend to have a bias to want to perceive each other positively because we're excited about this relationship and want to see it uh, continue. In ongoing relationships, accuracy is particularly important in certain contexts, as I've already mentioned. For instance, changes in commitment, investments. So what does that mean? Let's say you're dating someone and things are going well and you're quite happy and maybe now you're gonna make a decision. And uh, I'll, here's one example. You're like, well, should we move in together? <laughs> and uh, now you might take a moment to think a little more clearly about, hmm, is this good? And you might think more about pros and cons, like, should we do this? Is this a good thing? Like, uh, are we compatible enough to, to do this? Is our relationship strong enough to support this right now? Uh, so you might take a moment to think a little bit more accurately about the state of your relationship. And stronger accuracy when you're in a pre-decisional versus post-decisional mindset. I've already kind of mentioned this in prior uh, classes. When you're thinking about making a decision, you tend to think more about the pros and cons, like should we move in together, versus after you made the decision. Oh, we've decided to move in together. It's going to be wonderful. And now you focus on how things are going to be great. Uh, also, there can be some individual differences involved in uh, how people think that they're perceived by their partners. This is research by uh, Sandra Marine, John Holmes, and colleagues. And uh, I just want to show you kind of, well, excuse me, this is breaking it down on mean values. So um, you look at individuals' own self esteem. In this case, it's broken down, it says men on the left, women on the right. And then it's how they're how they think their partners perceive them on a number of traits, which is the blue line. And then the red line is how their partners actually perceive them. So these are people in relationships. So let's look at the men for a second. You have, uh, this is broken down to low and high self-esteem. This would typically be done with what's called a median split. Um, so you look at self-esteem and you look at the median, which is the midpoint or in terms of uh, half the people are on the low and half the people are in the high. And that's how they decide low and high self-esteem in this particular instance. So now we have low self-esteem, high self-esteem. Okay. Then it, within the, those groups, they calculated, okay, how do men think their partners view them uh, on across these traits? And then how do their partners actually view them on those traits? Because they have data from both the men and their partner. And you can see the big difference 
in is low self-esteem. Men think their partners view them a, on average six out of, say, I think this is a nine point scale, uh, six out of nine across those traits, whereas the partners actually view them close to a seven out of nine. Whereas men with high self-esteem tend to be a lot more accurate, meaning they think their partners see them at around 7.1 and their partners really see them at around 7.2. That's pretty close. The same as it goes for women. Women with lower self-esteem think their partners perceive them less positively than their partners actually perceive them. Whereas women with higher self-esteem uh, tend to feel that their partners perceive them in a way that their partners actually do perceive them. Those numbers are very close together. So now we have <clears throat> an individual difference where people with lower self-esteem think their partners maybe don't love them as much as they really do. Whereas people with higher self-esteem are a little more accurate in, at least in terms of the mean bias, in terms of how their partners perceive them. And there's some research, and this is part of uh, some of the readings for last uh, the, the past two weeks, uh, that uh, people with higher attachment anxiety tend to believe their partners uh, is less supportive than they actually are. Long story short, a lot of different research, and I'll go into the details on all of it, tends to show that people that are more anxiously attached uh, tend to think that their partners are not there for them, uh, whereas the partner, in fact, is there to be supportive for them. So I'm, let's say I'm very, I'm highly anxious, and I might say, oh, my partner is not very supportive of me in, when I'm you know, making decisions or what have you. Now, if you ask my partner, hey, how supportive are you of your partner in these situations? they'd actually say, oh, I'm actually quite supportive of them. So let's assume for a moment that my partner's telling the truth. Uh, so that kind of is consistent with this, meaning low self-esteem, but say high anxiety, I tend to under-report how supportive they actually are. So that's uh, kind of what I'm referring to here. I'm highly anxiously attached. I tend to under-perceive how much support is available to me. This has also been done with behavioral research where couples are videotaped discussing an issue in the relationship uh, where, you know, I'm seeking support and my partner's the support provider in that context. And you have people watch the video. Well, they'll say, oh yeah, Lauren's partner was actually quite supportive. Uh, and then you ask me how supportive I thought they were. Oh, I didn't think my partner's very supportive. So people that are more anxiously attached into uh, under report how supportive the partners are as well. And what about individual differences in context? Uh, so we already talked about lower self-esteem and anxiety, of course, but let's say you have a, a situation where one partner transgresses or otherwise behaves badly. Uh, so those with lower self-esteem, I have low self-esteem and I, my partner's been kind of saying rude to me, then research has shown that I tend to withdraw from my partner. So I can't handle the, the, that negativity. I have higher self-esteem, my partner behaves rudely to me. I'm like, oh, I don't like that. But you know what? Let's talk this out. People with lower self-esteem, the partner behaves rudely to them. It hurts quite a bit. And I, oh, I can't handle this. They tend to emotionally withdraw more from their partners. Now with high, uh, similar uh, pattern here, uh, those with higher attachment anxiety try to protect the self by hyperactively monitoring their partner. So let's use a different example here. Uh, I go to a, a party, uh, like a social event with my partner, and I'm very, let's say I'm very anxiously attached. And I look across the room, and my partner is talking with someone. Uh, so let's say, you know, my wife is talking with this guy and uh, they're laughing and she flicks her hair a little bit and he's, you know, smiling at her and uh, and so on if i'm very anxiously attached i might look at that and be particularly jealous and want to monitor the situation and maybe move in and put my arm around her and kind of be a little upset and you know, what's going on here right thinking that uh they're flirting with each other and that this is not good for our relationship whereas if i'm not very anxiously attached i might look at that and go oh that's nice. They're having fun and uh, getting to know people at the party. Awesome. And then turn around and continue with my conversation partner. So individual differences can bias how you perceive the moment is, is what we're uh, getting at here. Now we're going to get into some other research, a little bit different, uh, focusing on reading minds. So do I know what my partner's thinking and feeling? Do they know what I'm thinking and feeling? 
And oftentimes, excuse me, we don't always stop to ask our partners these questions. We just we're trying to guess online through our, our interactions. Uh, and uh, as you can imagine, we're not always correct. So how do you actually study this? I want to just bring this up because this was kind of pioneered, uh, you know, a few decades ago and uh, it's called empathic accuracy. So let's say, uh, okay, well, I'll just read these cues and then tell you. One partner judges another's nonverbal cues and reading innocuous statements. One partner guesses another's thoughts and feelings when viewing a videotape interaction. So what does this mean? Now let's say uh, me and my partner, go into a room at the in, in a laboratory and we have a conversation with each other about our relationship and it lasts for say five minutes uh, at five minutes the researcher comes in and says great hey thanks okay now what we're going to do is we're going to put you in your own rooms and we each go to our own room and there's a television screen there like a monitor and a recording of our interaction is played for us like for me and for my partner in our own rooms and what I'm asked to do, my partner's asked to do, is to pause the recording whenever we remembered having a thought or feeling during the interaction. So at 30 seconds, I pause and I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember thinking, like, what is she trying to get at here? Is she, is she trying to, you know, uh, like, is she trying to tell me something uh, like, without telling me? Like, is she trying to say she's not happy? And that's what I, was, I thought she was thinking or feeling cause I, based on, on these cues. And then it goes on. She does the same thing. She watches it, and, and, right? Then after we're done, the researcher comes back and goes, okay. Uh, and they say to my partner, you know, Lauren, he said he had a thought or a feeling at all these different times during this five minute interaction. And I want you to rewatch it. And at each of those times, try to guess what they wrote down, uh, what they were thinking or feeling. So I'll just use the one example again. She watches it because of the 30 second mark. And I wrote down, oh, I think she's trying to tell me something here with her behavior. And I'm not sure what it is, but I think she's you know, maybe not happy. And she's just trying to figure out a way to tell me. And so she watches it. She gets to that point and she's trying to, she's asked to guess what I'm thinking or feeling in that moment. And she might go, huh? And she might go, you know what? I bet you he's probably wondering if I'm trying to send him a message. But that's, a, that's perfect accuracy, right? Or she might be like, huh, I don't know what exactly what he's thinking or feeling, but I don't know, maybe he has some concerns about uh, the, the relationship because he kind of has this look on his face. So that's, you know, hey, that's part way there. Like that's kind of like, you know, 50% accuracy as it might be coded. Or she might be like, oh, you know, I, I bet you he's probably thinking about that camping trip he wants to go on with his friends and, and, uh, and uh, doesn't know how to tell me. And of course that's, you know, not close at all. So the point is, I list what, I'm th what I was thinking or feeling during the interaction, and then the researcher shares those times with my partner and vice versa, and then we rewatch it and try to guess what the partner's thinking or feeling. This approach has been used not just with people in relationships, uh, but also people that don't know each other. They put them together, have an interaction, and then go through the same procedure. And it's been used quite a bit to study and to uh, assess what I just I called empathic accuracy or mind reading. What do these studies show? Well, people's thoughts and feelings are different from their verbal behavior. Not always, but often enough, especially when discussing relationship problems. Private cognitions, meaning it, what I say I'm thinking or feeling, are often more uh, pessimistic. We don't always share that with our partner. I might think, oh, I don't know, my partner might not be happy with the relationship, but instead of saying, I'm concerned you're not happy with the relationship, it might be, like, so, you know, do you think you want to go to that party with me next week? Right. And I'm trying to use that as a gauge to see uh, what they're, how they're going to respond. So sometimes what I'm thinking in that moment and feeling is not always how, what I'm sharing. And therefore I'm not always giving the best cues for my partner to, you know, be accurate with uh, in, in how they can guess my thoughts and feelings. And, Oftentimes we don't share the extent of our concerns with our, with our partner. And maybe we're concerned that, well, they tell us the truth and that would hurt, or, um, you know, we just don't want to know the truth and we want to try to dance around the issue to, to see if we can find cues to what the answer really is. 
What people say they think about suggests that they attempt to not only mind read each other, but also relationship read. So again, a lot of the times we're, we might have a certain thought or a feeling, and instead of just coming right out with it, we often uh, try to, excuse me, uh, indirectly find out what the answer might be. When mind reading, stronger accuracy is associated with activity in the prefrontal cortex. So if you remember the discussion in the relationship body and the brain and elements of the mirror neuron system. So, uh, you know, using the prefrontal cortex and when activity is higher there, uh, empathic accuracy tends to be higher. Uh, and some research has suggested that it increases in oxytocin improves mind reading. So that can be done in a variety of ways, not just monitoring oxytocin levels, which is challenging, but some research uh, where uh, uh, you can have a, a nasal spray that contains nothing, like just water mist, but the participant doesn't know, uh, or oxytocin, which, um, and, you know, so you give them a boost in oxytocin or compared to a control condition. And then you can see that empathic accuracy levels increase in, in those conditions. Also, mind reading accuracy uh, can increase depending on how well you know the person, which I guess can make sense. So on the left axis here, it says 30, 40, 50, 60. That's mind reading accuracy in percent. So that videotape or the you know recording uh, method I talked about, there's a number, uh, I report 10 thoughts or feelings during the interaction. And then the person is asked to my interaction partner is asked to guess uh, what I was thinking or feeling during the uh, at those 10 times. And if we're strangers, you can see that the stranger is accurate about 39% of the time. Uh, so close to four out of 10, they'd get right. If we're friends, you can see it goes up, say around, you know, 42, 43%. So now they're getting, you know, instead of 3.9 out of 10, they're getting 4.3 out of 10. But if it's my dating partner, it's now around 50%. So they are able to kind of read my mind better. Long story short, the more you know somebody, the little more intimate you are with them, uh, often mind reading accuracy tends to increase. And this study focused on strangers, friends, and dating partners in particular. Now, self-report versus reality. If we were to ask people, hey, do you think you're a good mind reader? People may think they're good at mind reading, but self-reports of judgment accuracy don't always map on to actual mind reading. So I'm in that interaction. I report having 10 thoughts or feelings. My interaction partner is asked to guess what they are. They're also asked, how confident are you that you're right? Well, how confident they are that they're right doesn't correspond to their own accuracy. People aren't always good at guessing how right they are. Multiple factors can influence judgment accuracy, of course. So it's hard to tell exactly how much personal ability is the cause. And then getting feedback and accuracy of social judgment is, is rare. Uh, I might have a thought or feeling and I'm not publicly sharing it to my partner. Uh, so in that moment, they're, they're not using cues to try to guess what I'm thinking or feelings. I'm not telling them I'm thinking or feeling anything. I'm just having my own private thoughts. And, uh, what oh, sorry <laughs> change and those who are generally higher in social intelligence may not rate themselves as very good on self-report measures because they understand the limitations of reading others so some people go oh, i don't know if i'm very good at reading others but maybe they are so and many judgments people make may be automatic and or unconscious so long story short there's a lot of reasons why people are not always good at determining if they in fact are accurate at understanding what other people are thinking or feeling that's kind of the take-home message some people are better mind readers. Uh, on average, it's just a few things. Uh, if you're to uh, run a lot of studies and you ask people a variety of questions and you look to see who tends to have higher mind reading accuracy, well, those who tend to have higher levels of education, on average, uh, women tend to be better than men. Uh, that can depend on circumstances. I won't go into that. Just in general, women tend to be better than men, uh, have higher IQs, which may or may not correspond to being better educated, and uh, score higher on measures of cognitive complexity. Uh, so they tend to, you know, think more about things and try to focus more on why things are happening. Uh, and those folks tend to be better at mind reading accuracy. And some folks are better mind 
readers that, right? So when circumstances are distressing, certain people become more accurate mind readers. So uh, in certain moments in a relationship, um, say people are more anxiously attached, even though they have a negative bias and that they tend to interpret things more negative than they really are, they often are responding to things that are potentially real concerns at the same time. So in that case, they have high tracking accuracy, even though they have a negative bias. So they tend to be better mind readers in that sense, particularly in distressing situations. So I'll wrap up for this section. How can love be both blind and rooted in reality? Bias judgments can still be rational. Accuracy can be broken down to directional bias, like mean level and correlationally or tracking accuracy. So perceivers can be both positively biased and accurate, positively biased and not tracking accurate, or not positively biased and tracking accurate, right? They can be both, just one or neither. Those things are independent of each other. And it seems to be that uh, people are aware of uh, directional bias uh, and then be happy with it. Mind reading is hard, why? Behavioral information is, has to be available. It's often not available talk to somebody. Some people might have very intense thoughts or feelings during that interaction, but maybe not show any cues to it. You might not even be aware what they're thinking or feeling. I've certainly had experiences in my life where someone after an interaction, we talk and they're like, wow, I was really distressed because I thought this is what you're thinking or saying or feeling. I'm like, huh? And I, I felt, no, I, I wasn't, but they thought I was. Uh, and so, but they didn't give me any cues that they were distressed even though I didn't know I was giving cues that they that they should think and feel the way they did. It's only later when we had that conversation that we realized we were both way off. Now, information, when it is available, needs to be a reliable diagnostic indicator of the trait, et cetera, in question, which is not always the case. And perceivers have to pick up and appropriately use the information, as such information is often fleeting and accompanied by many other related behaviors. So, me, as a communicator, has to provide a cue to how I'm thinking or feeling. And the person I'm communicating with has to be able to use that cue to accurately infer what I was thinking or feeling. Well, I might not give cues that well, and they might be you know, vague cues. And when the cues are there, the person might not be very good at picking up on them. So you can see how accuracy can break down fairly quickly. Cues might not be available. They might be vague. And when they are available, they might not be accurately picked up on for a variety of other reasons. What I'm going to do now is, because I've been talking for a while, I'm actually going to stop this recording, uh, and then I'll put this one up as A, and then our, you know, and then I'll do another recording for for this one here, uh, just so that you have the the two broken down that way. Thank you, and I'll pick this back up here in just a moment.